we're very excited to be here. Uh, we got some friends here today, too. The Johnson family's here to visiting today. We'll welcome them. I, I brought my own gang in case not, you guys don't collaborate, you know, you know. So I told them to laugh at all the jokes and everything, so. But I'm excited to be here. Actually, we're going to start out a little bit different today. Before I, uh, before I preach, uh, my daughters are going to sing today, and uh, they're, they can come up and start getting ready for that. Uh, well, we do a little trivia about Venezuela, and uh, to see how much you know about Venezuela, and some of you guys know some stuff, and some of you don't. So we're going to do real quick. We got a few, uh, a few images here that I want to share with you. So this is uh, the bills in Venezuela. Uh, the, during the, the years that we've been there, they've changed a lot, the, beer, the bills. So it started when we first got there, like the one over here on the bottom left. There's a 2, a 5, a 10, a 20, a 50, a 100. So the question, question is, how much is $1 worth? Is it worth this block of money down here on the left, bottom left. The next one we're going to go top right. It goes to 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. So uh, do you think $1 is worth that? On the one on the, on the left is 10,000, 20,000, 50,000. And the bottom right is 20,000, 500,000, and 1 million. So how much is $1 worth? Which one of those you think is $1 worth? Bottom Right, top right, left right. Huh? Any ideas? I'll give you a clue. None of them. Uh, it's actually four million right now for one dollar. So you'd have to put them all together. It still wouldn't make four million. So it's uh, the the economy in Venezuela is just so crazy that uh, inflation was about a million percent for two years in a row uh, in 2019 in 2018. So that was crazy. And uh, so it's hard uh, keeping up with the money. So they add zeros all the time. But in October 1st, they're going to take away six zeros. So four million, they'll take away, you know, the, the, the one million will be one Bolivar instead. So uh, it'll take four Bolivares for a dollar at that time. And then next week, it'll probably be more. So uh, that's kind of a little bit of economy of Venezuela. Let's go to the second trivia. Okay, what do we got here? Okay. Uh, this is uh, some of the local birds. Which one of these is not local in Caracas? <laughs> You're probably thinking the Moana bird, right, the Disney one. Yeah, that's, that's right. But, uh, yeah, we have a lot of pigeons. The bottom left one is called a turpial, and it's, you see them all every, everywhere. It's the national bird of Venezuela. But the top left one is a macaw. I don't know if you can tell by the angle, but they invaded the city, and even though uh, they don't have natural predators there, so... And they live for like 60 years or more, so they can be around for a while. So there's a ton of macaws in the city, and uh, people feed them. So they come to people's balconies like that, and people will give them bananas, give them sunflower seeds. They love sunflower seeds, and they'll come there like clock every day to your window if you feed them, and you'll have, you'll have them lined up like that, a bunch of them. They're beautiful animals. And we have them flying all over Caracas, which is strange, but uh, they're supposed to be in the jungle somewhere, but they're not. So this is kind of a cool thing in Venezuela. I live in Venezuela, see these animals just free. Sandra had two of these in her house as a pet growing up, and they, they used to attack me when I was there, but they didn't like me as much. But, yeah, they got a big beak. You want to stay away from them. So um, next trivia, let's see what else we got. Do we have another one? Okay, so there's lines for everything. Uh, my wife says that Caracas is known for the country of the lines. You make line for everything. And this is just a, a little example of it. Uh, the top left is uh, it's vaccination. People are in this gym. The whole gym is full. They have a little space between each person. But uh, this is for people getting vaccinated. So if you want to get vaccinated, my brother-in-law, was in, he took this picture. You, he didn't do a good job. He took a picture of the gym, most of all. But, uh, but really... Uh, he spent there 12 hours that day, and he was supposed to get his vaccination that day. He was on a list, and they never made it to his number. He had to come back the second day. So 12 hours in line to get vaccinated. So top right, that's uh, people standing in line for food. The government likes to give out free food, especially when the, there is no food because he ran out of most of the companies that produce the food, so now they have to import it. So when they do import it and bring it in, they try to sell it a little bit cheaper, and people will line up like crazy like that. that isn't the, that's not even a line. I don't know what that is. It's a mob uh, to get into the supermarket. That, uh, so uh, bottom left is gasoline. I probably, you probably heard this, but gasoline in Venezuela for the last 30 years is free. It's been free. I don't pay you know, but less than a penny for gas to fill up my tank of gas. So it's free. 
except uh, that uh, because of the situation in Venezuela now, uh, the oil production has stopped, and they're not producing the, uh, the gas anymore. They don't have all the chemicals. There's like a sanction on Venezuela right now. So there is no gas. There's a little bit of gas coming from Iran. So people are making lines like this that are up to 24 hours. And you can only see one block there, but it can go up to about 10, 12 miles. If you're outside of Caracas, it could be miles long and days for you to get gas. So you can still get it free. But pretty much free, but you have to make that line. Now, bottom right is people, what are they doing? Can you recognize? They're selling tubs of water. A, no. They're collecting water because they're, they haven't had water in probably for days. So a, a truck will come by with water and they'll fill it up. The same kind of trucks that spray water on the trees and stuff like that. They'll come in, people will bring their containers. I don't know how they get the containers back to their houses, but uh, they fill them up. During the week. No, so the question is, which one of these at the present is not happening? Which one of these lines I do not have to do right now? Anybody want to guess? Nobody. They're all scared about missing. Which right. Top right. That's right. That is correct. Were you in the first sermon? <laughs> Somebody told you, right? Okay, so he was here earlier. No. Yeah, top right. Why isn't there lines at the, uh, the supermarket anymore? Because the government isn't giving free food anymore at the supermarket. So there's no lines for that. <laughs> so everything else we're still making lines to do. We're, uh, we're lucky. We get two days uh, water two days a week. Uh, so we're lucky. Some people don't get it for weeks at all. So that's a little trivia of uh, stuff that's going on. Uh, where are my daughters? Are they around here? Oh, there they are. You're supposed to be up here getting ready to sing. So... They're going to sing to you, um, and if you guys have more questions, I'll be at the end of the service uh, answering some questions. We also have uh, prayer cards that you guys can, uh, if you want one, if you want to sign up for a newsletter, get the updates monthly. Uh, there's the address there that you can go to the website, teamexpansion.org, slash the dies, and you can sign up for a newsletter and get more info. And uh, so the girls are going to sing a song called uh, Everything's Going to Be All Right. It's, it's on the radio like all the time if you listen to a Christian radio station, Evan Craft. So we don't have the lyrics, but if you want to look up the lyrics real quick in your phone, Evan Craft, everything's going to be all right. But basically, it talks about the whole world is in God's hands, and that's why everything's going to be all right. So if you hear some strange language going on at the part of the song, there's some Spanish in the song. So, uh, and that's Sophia's going to do some of the Spanish. So. <laughs> There's a name that can silence every fear There's a love that embraces the heartache, the pain, and the tears Through my faith and my doubting, I know one thing for sure his word is unfailing, his promise secure. Todo va a estar bien, everything will be alright. The whole world's in his hands, the whole world's in his hands. In the darkness, in the trials, he's faithful and he's true. The whole world's in his hands. Todo va a estar bien. Whoa, oh, everything will be alright. Whoa, oh. Father, you say everything is gonna be alright. But my circumstances say I won't last through the night. I need your word to hold me now. I need you to pull me through. I need a miracle, a breakthrough. I need you. They say you hold the whole universe in your hands. But my world's falling apart like it is made of sand. Am I small enough to slip through the cracks? Can you take my broken pieces and put them back? Give me faith to believe you're on my side. Open my eyes to see you working in my life. Let the past remind me you never fail and tell my soul it is well oh told if I start bien everything will be all right the whole world's in his hands the whole world's in his hands 
past the darkness and the trials He's faithful and he's true The whole world's in his hands Todo va a estar bien Whoa, oh, 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 everything will be all right. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. Padre, te confieso, corazón abierto, que todo es muy incierto en este desierto. Mi vulnerabilidad está al descubierto. Siento que mi barco está muy lejos de su puerto. ¿Por qué será que ya no sale sol en mis días? ¿Por qué mis noches son tan frías? ¿Por qué será que siento que me falta algo? ¿Por qué este camino que se siente tan largo? Sé que estás sobrando aunque no te sienta Sé que estás sobrando aunque no te vea Sé que voy a salir de esta odisea Sé que voy a ganar esta pelea Sé que va a cesar esta marea temporal Y aquí en ti yo viviré una vida extraordinaria Y aunque no pueda entender Me conceda saber que todo Yo sé que Todo va a estar bien Everything will be alright The whole world's in his hands The whole world's in his hands In the darkness and the trials He's faithful and he's true The whole world's in his hands Todo va a estar bien Whoa, oh, oh, oh. Everything will be alright Whoa, oh, oh, oh. He's got the whole world in his hands He's got the whole world in his hands in his hands, he's got the whole wide world in his hands. Todo el mundo en su mano está, todo el mundo en su mano está, todo el mundo en su mano está. So now you know why I didn't sing with them. I can't do that rap part. It's too fast. I mean, uh, if you were trying to keep up with the Spanish, I don't know, with that song, that's not easy. Um, Julia is uh, on her way to college the next year, so this is her. She's a senior, and actually she's recording her first single. She's a songwriter, too, which is awesome, and she's recording her first single next week. So before we go to Venezuela, we're stopping in Miami, and uh, she's going to finish something up there. And uh, so we're excited about that. And uh, Sofia just turned 11, so she's got a long way to go yet. Keep her home for a while. We're excited to be here and uh, share the, the word with you. I got Steve Walker's Bible here, so you know the sermon's going to be good, right? So <laughs> he's had this Bible, he told me, since, uh, since we were in college, and he taught us from this Bible. So hopefully this will be good. Uh, I'm excited to be here and share the, a little bit about... Uh, the message today, we're talking about the, um, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, and it's, uh, you can find it, it's the only miracle that's actually in all four Gospels, so you can look, you can find it in any other Gospel. Did you know that? I didn't know that until last year. Uh, it's the only miracle of all the miracles that all four of them, like, uh, record. And I thought, well, that, that means it's, a, it's an important miracle, so we should study this. So I'm glad that this week is uh, in this series that we've been studying some of the life of Jesus and his, and his teachings that I got to teach on this. Because not only am I glad that this is a cool miracle, but it has exactly, um, it's going to talk about what I want to talk about anyways. And you probably read this story many, many times, and there's a lot of applications for this story that are good. But I'm going to uh, take one application of it that I think applies to the theme of today. And uh, so let's pray before we get started because I already preached. I'm not used to preaching twice in a row in Venezuela. So I think I already said all this. So I'm like, did I already say this? And I don't use notes. So that's very confusing. So here we go. Let's pray. Dear God, just thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the girls singing and uh, ministering through the uh, song that, you, that we know that the whole world's in your hands, that despite all the chaos that we know is going on in, in places like Afghanistan, Haiti, Venezuela, and even the pandemic here in, the, in all parts of the world, Lord, that you are in control and you have a plan, Lord, and that you are working 
in the midst of all these problems. I pray that you will also open our hearts for the message today so that we can uh, uh, listen to it and apply it to our lives. Uh, thank you for all the people that are visiting uh, today. Uh, bless them too. In your name we pray. Amen. Speaking of, I got another friend here from college that came over to visit. So Roger's somewhere over there in here, yeah, up front here. So glad to see you. I haven't seen him probably in a lot, many years. We played soccer together, so that was that was fun. Uh, so uh, this summer, um, the one question I want you guys kind of be thinking about today is, what are you hungry for? Because we're talking about feeding of the 5,000, you know. So what are you hungry for? These people were not just hungry for food, which is what the story is about, right? But they were actually hungry for Jesus. Because if you read the story, to start out the story, uh, Jesus has done, is done teaching. And he says, okay, it's time for us to go take a break. He's going to take his disciples and they're going to go to a solitary place to be on their own, own to recuperate, you know, to eat or whatever. And, these peop- and they'll get on this boat and the people will follow from the shore to there. So if you want to read with me, I, we can like pick up... Uh, you can read from Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, but I'm reading from Mark right now. Um, Mark chapter 6. And he said, verse 31, and he said, said to him, Come away by yourself to a lonely place and rest a while. For there were many people coming and going, and they didn't even have time to eat. And they went away on the boat to a lonely place by themselves. And the people saw them going, and many recognized them, and they ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. So this was like an avalanche. It started building. So some of them started running, and then like people were like, where are they going? I'll, I'll join us. They went by different towns and cities. People joined in. By the time uh, Jesus you know, gets to a spot where he thought it was going to be a lonely place, you know, to rest and get, you know, you know, recuperated or whatever. Uh, it ends up there's at least 5,000 men there because the story tells us that they fed 5,000 men without counting women and children. So there's a big multitude of people because people were hungry for Jesus. They've seen Jesus speak now. His, pub- his ministry had become public. He's been healing people. People can't have enough of Jesus. And maybe you're here today because... That's why you're here, because you want more of Jesus. You want to learn more of Jesus. You want more of Jesus. So, uh, so people were there, and I love, I love, this is what the story is about, because Jesus' response to this was um, verse 34. He says, in disembarking, he saw a great multitude, and he felt compassion for them. So Jesus looks at him, and he's like, oh, this is incredible. Look how hungry these people are for the gospel. He feels compassion for them. But why does he feel compassion for them? Not just because they are hungry, but because they are lost. Because the second part of the verse says, for the, uh, compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Right? So, um, so, Sheep without a shepherd, that means uh, when a sheep doesn't have a shepherd, it's because the sheep is lost. So this story is about lost people and Jesus feeling compassion for the lost people and wanting to meet their need. Yes, physically he's going to meet their need, but especially more he wants to teach them. And the scripture says, uh, says that specifically there. And he began to teach them many things. It doesn't say he began making bread, you know. He didn't turn on the ovens and all that kind of stuff, start cooking the food for the people. He starts giving them what they really need, right? To feed them with what really is going to satisfy. So my question today is, are you hungry for God? First question, but are you hungry also for his will, for doing his will? And um, which takes us to a different step, right? Um, And we'll get to that in a in a minute. This summer has been crazy with the Olympics. I've been watching most of it. Have you guys seen any, any of the Olympics? Any favorite things? I, I liked like the 100 meter thing. You know, that's that's one of my favorite. And uh, but always everything's about the gold. You know, nobody remembers silver and bronze, right? 
Everybody, who wins the gold? And, and the difference sometimes is like a split second, like a nose, whatever, in, 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 in winning some of these races. It's so close. I don't even, they need technology to see that. But only the person that gets the gold gets all the glory, right? So I was watching. There's this little app that tells you who, what countries have all the medals. And I was like, the only thing I cared about, because I didn't see a lot of the, of the Olympics, is like, who got more gold? You know, which country got more medals and more gold? And the United States is always fighting for that. And they're always in the top three, you know. But I was like, this year, it was like we're in the second place or third place during the whole thing, at least with the gold. And China was beating us for 10 gold, 15 golds more. Not gold, that's soccer, but gold uh, medals. And I was like, oh, can we catch him? So it came down to the last day, and I was preaching that Sunday, actually, doing this same sermon. And I was like, you know, right now we're waiting. In a few minutes, there's going to be three more chances for the U.S. to win low, uh, gold. And we're behind by two. So we can either tie it or lose or go ahead. At the end of the sermon, we had one. It was thanks to my sermon, of course. <laughs> Everybody started praying in the service. No. Uh, but it was like two boxing, so I don't think God answers those. Uh, so... The United States won by one gold medal. I forget the number. It's like, I don't forget, like 98, 100 and some gold medals. I don't know what it was. But it was awesome. We, we remember the gold. Silver and bronze, not so much. So this picture, there's the guy in the gold. He's like Olympic fever. He's jumping out. This is not from this Olympic. Sorry, I just, the first image that popped up, I got it. But he's so excited. And then uh, there's second place over here to the right. He's, he's is, that he, is that a bear in his hand? Or something. I don't know what he has in his hand, but it looks like he had something. Okay, and there's this guy on this side, and he's a little bit happy. They came up with a study in a, that I read that week that they wanted to see who's happier, the guy that gets the silver or the guy that gets the bronze. So which one do you think would be happy, silver, silver or bronze? I'd say silver because obviously first, second place is better than third place, right? Well, wrong. It's, it turns out that the people that win bronze are happier than the people that win the silver medal. So I, started, I kept reading the article. It's interesting, you know. And you can tell even in this picture, the guy over here in the bronze, I got a little smile. This guy's over here, he's like, hey, I hate him, you know. <laughs> I know, he's got the little smirk. I don't know what's going on with that guy. Even though it looks like he's almost the same country, he's got the same color or something. But they found out that bronze people... Uh, are very happy, I'll get to that. But the silver people are always like thinking, I almost made gold. I was just a fraction of a second of gold. So they're disappointed. They get the silver, but it's like a consolation. In soccer, you don't want silver. <laughs> Never. I mean, they don't, the players don't even want to put the medal on. And they usually like just, they grab their medal and they don't put them on. Some of them are like more polite and they'll put them on. Most of the players will not put the silver medal on in soccer at least, and that's not the Olympics, but, uh, but they're like, oh, I almost, I almost had gold, it was so close, and they're disappointed, bronze people, they're thinking, they're so happy, because they're, they're like, at least I beat the hundred people behind me, you know, <laughs> at least I got a medal, and nobody else got one, so they're so excited to, to be in the top three, to be in the podium, so they're happy, and because they beat all the rest, silver is like, I could have been the best. So what's this have to do with Christianity and everything? So let's see if we can apply this to the Bible. Uh, I was thinking that it does apply a lot because many of us are at least in the bronze medal category. Bronze medal means, according to John, <laughs> means that you have found hope. You have found Christ. You have found, you know, salvation, you know. So you're a Christian. And bronze medal, people are happy because they don't have to carry the guilt of sin anymore. They have this hope. So they're, they're happy people. You know, they're thinking, yeah, the other people aren't. You know, they're not. If they don't go to heaven, at least I'm going to heaven. This is great news. And, and they're excited. And they'll go to church and they'll worship, you know. They're, they're happy people. Silver, what's silver medal for me? I think silver medal is the people that are not satisfied with bronze. They want to go for gold. And there are people that will get involved in church. 
they will serve in church they will lead in church whether it's in the worship or it's either in the kids ministry any kind of ministry i mean they're serving in church leadership even preaching because they want they want to give their best they want to go for gold but something happens sometimes uh, for the silver people is that when we're doing a lot of things in church, we get busy at doing church things, and sometimes we even forget uh, forget our the real goal, which is gold, because we're busy doing all the, the good stuff in church. And what happens, and I'll explain what gold is in a second, but stay with me. But uh, we get content sometimes and what happens with silver people is that they know there's something more they can do i mean yes i'm serving the church yes i'm a leader i sing i you know i give is there something else they feel like there's something else they should be doing they have that hunger there's something more and sometimes they can't figure out what is that something else that they have to do to get gold and uh, because they already have salvation and they're already involved in church, so they're like, okay, something's missing. And what happens is you'll see people that are with the silver medal that sometimes they drop out of church or change church or because they're confused. They don't, they feel like they, they oh, maybe something, maybe the preacher's not good enough or maybe the song's not good enough or maybe the, there should be, somebody should be doing more at church and they're not content they want more. They're looking for gold, but they don't know where, what gold is. Today, I'm going to tell, tell you what gold is. I'm going to tell you what Bible says gold is. And I think you know what gold is. Because Jesus' last words, right, kind of told us his whole purpose of him coming. He died on the cross, took our place, saved us, suffered everything, got it, was substituted. He took our punishment so that we could be free. And that's the good news, and he wants everybody to be free, everybody to know this, everybody to get rescued. So Jesus says his last words, if you want to be my disciple, you need to go and make disciples of all nations. Matthew, right, 28, 19, says go to all the nations, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all things. So Jesus is telling, okay, you, this, is what you're, this is the plan, Plan A, this is plan A. This is the, the goal. Go make disciples of everyone, all nations. I mean, that word nations can be translated several wor words. Some people translate it ethnics groups. It doesn't have to be geographical, which that means that there might be people from, you know, some remote country far away from here that moved to Cincinnati, but those people fall in that category. Because they don't have, they haven't been reached for Christ. So, this is my idea of what gold is. Where do I get that idea? Well, Jesus said, you know, these people are like sheep without pastors. They're lost. But let's go see a couple more verses of this story, and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain some more. But the disciples come and say, okay, at the end of the day, it's been, now everybody's exhausted. Jesus has been teaching another full day, doing miracles and all that stuff. And uh, they're in a remote area because that's where Jesus wanted to go. And there's no food for the people. So the disciples are thinking, okay, send home everybody. They tell Jesus, send the people home because there's no food here. And uh, they need to eat. Everybody's hungry. And they're thinking, we're hungry too. We're tired too. Send the people home. And disciples are worried about themselves. I mean, they're, they, they usually go for gold. They were going for gold the, uh, the day before because Jesus had sent them out, and they had been gone over there, and they were witnessing to people. But now, now they're like, okay, it's time for me to take a nap, time for me to rest. Send the people home, Jesus. Let's take a break. And Jesus' words are, I love them. I think we have the verse up there. Do we have that verse up there? He tells them, you give them something to eat. <laughs> Underline that in your Bible. That's in Matthew 1, but it says it also in Mark. You know, uh, it's verse, if you're in still Mark 37. But he answered, you give them something to eat. Thanks. 
So you give them something to eat. So remember, these are sheep that are lost, and now they're hungry too. But we're talking, first of all, that they're hungry for the gospel. So I think Jesus is kind of doing a, he's going to teach them a lesson. Yes, that it's going to be about physical needs right now, but the whole purpose was spiritual needs. And Jesus wants them to know that admit, you're the one that has to meet the spiritual needs of these people. You're the one that has to, are going to have to, I'm not going to be here long. You know, in this story, the disciples didn't know that. But he's like, you're the one that's going to have to be uh, here and go and feed the people. Now, if you put these two together, you might remember another story in the Bible that has to be, that has to do with feeding sheep and also, you know, uh, so you think, think of another story about feeding sheep and then Jesus telling somebody to do it. You might remember what story. Anybody can help me on this? More trivia. Peter, thank you. So Peter, when? After the resurrection, after Peter denied Christ, Jesus runs into him at the beach. They're fishing and all that kind of stuff. They catch a lot of fish again. Jesus takes him out to the side after they eat breakfast, of course. And then... Uh, and he asked, asked Peter, do you love me? Which is a tough question because Peter denied him three times. And Jesus is going to ask him three times whether he loves him or not. And, the, and then he'll answer this saying, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, then care for the lost sheep. You know, go reach the lost sheep. Because many of us love Jesus in the bronze medal kind of thing, you know. I'm saved, I'm happy, I'm delighted. You know, I can worship. But you can't love Jesus unless you're willing to really die for Jesus. You can't live for Jesus unless you're willing to die for him. So Jesus says this is what real love is. And disciples are trying to figure this whole thing out. So Jesus tells them, you feed them. And they're like, how is that going to happen? We, how can we do that? Uh, they start explaining it takes six, you know, six months or something of money to feed all these people. We don't have that. It, uh, where do we get this? And the disciples are thinking, Jesus, you feed them. You're the miracle worker, right? You can do the miracle. You can do something. You feed them. But Jesus is like, no, you feed them. So... Who ends up feeding them? <laughs> so the next question that Jesus asks him. So first of all, we got to get this straight. God wants us. God wants to use us to feed the people. And not just, I'm not talking about physically here, even though the story is about that apparently. It's about feeding them spiritually and reaching the lost. So he asks him another question. He, he says, you know, he says, um, what verse are we on? How many loaves do you have? 38, thanks. How many loaves do you have? So Jesus starts asking me, what is it? So what do you have? You know, because they're saying we don't have anything. Jesus, do something. We, we can't do anything. But Jesus, says, no, no, wait, wait, what? you're focused on the wrong thing. What do you mean you don't have? How many do you have? And they scramble and they find five loaves and two fishes. And they still obviously think that's not enough, right? So uh, it's like, yeah, we, we have this, but, you know, that won't even feed us 12, you know, plus Jesus, 13. So this is not going to feed a lot of people. We don't have much. So they're thinking about how much they they don't, what they don't have and Jesus question is not what they don't have is what they do have so how much do you have because Jesus can take your smallest thing and make something incredible out of it right and they're like they're still not getting it you know it so like yeah we got five or whatever he's like that that's that's more than enough <laughs> okay give me that so he grabs those five loaves and two fishes, and he feeds 5,000 people, and 12 baskets are fu left full for the disciples. They'll have, they'll have leftovers for a few days, right? God does something incredible. And, and but what did it take? It took them giving the little that they have. 
And my question for us today is what, what is it that you have? Because we tend to focus on what we don't have. So I don't have time. You know, I'm, uh, I don't have the age. I'm either too old, retired, right, or too young. I don't have enough experience or, you know, I can't even leave my home without permission from my parents. You know, we have a lot of things that we don't have. Maybe I don't have the talent. You know, I can't sing in Spanish and rap at the same time. You know, maybe, maybe we don't have... You know, there's a lot of uh, things that we don't have, and that's and God knows that we don't have a lot of things. He didn't make us like uh, to have every talent and every resource in the world. I mean, most of us will have one or two things, right? And then we're lacking on everything else. So what is it that you do have? Because God wants to focus on that. Because God wants to use that that you do have, even though it's small, whatever it is. You know, it may not be a much, but he wants to do something great. At. And you can, time after time, you can find examples of that in the Bible. But this was the time for the disciples. And he takes that, and he does something great. So imagine what God can do with what you have. Because he, and he wants you to feed them. So now we got it figured out. we got two important points. God wants you to feed them, and he wants to use whatever you have. So... Uh, some of us would say, well, one of the things I don't have is a calling for missions, right? Anybody here ever been called, felt called to the mission field? Anybody here? No? I have, you know, back 25 years ago, Bible college. Which is funny because, did I just read Matthew 28, right, 19? What's it say there again? Go where? To all nations, to all people, to all ethnia, to all, go to those people and what? Make disciples. Don't go on vacation. Don't go to the beach in Thailand and Hawaii. And all. That's not what the going is about. It's going to make disciples. Whether it is geographically far away or it might be close to you, close to your house. It might be through the internet. There's no limits to this remember oh but i can't go well there's the internet right oh i can't go to that country but there's there you got neighbors that are from that country so god kind of makes it easy on us what is it that you do have and let's work with that you know don't, no excuses so everybody should have raised their hand when they said anybody been called to the mission field but we think mission field only like uh Overseas it, mission field or whatever. But every one of us is called. This is the great commission, not the great suggestion, right? Every one of us have been called to reach the nations, especially the people that don't have, I mean, that don't have the opportunity because of language barriers, because of cultural barriers in the Middle East, because they're in a country where it's illegal, like the Taliban's in control, and they don't have... It's illegal to be a Christian, so those people don't have access to that. So those are the per per people that are most lost, right? They're more lost than anybody else. Are they putting... Oh, okay. There is a picture of uh, some people in Afghanistan. There's a lot of, been a lot of pictures this week, right? The stuff in our hearts are, like, beating for them, for them you know, Um I like this one. Uh, this is one of my favorites, the people that did get rescued. You know, some of the lucky ones that were ma able to make it on the plane. There's not much room there, right, to sit, or I, I don't think there, there's chairs in those kind of planes, you know. But they're crammed in there. I don't know if they can fit anymore unless they start stacking them. But it's, it's sad how tight they are, but this is a, and they all look kind of scared. They don't know what, I, I mean, I can't really tell their expression. But the good news is that there's hope for these people, right? They're getting out of harm's way. But you guys have seen the other picture. I don't even have to show you the other pictures of the ones that didn't make it onto the plane, right? All the other people that are trying to get out because the Taliban's coming in. And now a lot of them, these people are Christians and they have liberties that they didn't have before. And all that's going to be taken away again from them. You guys know the story. And why is this happening? Well, 
I'm not, I will, I'll try not to get political here because I know that's not the point, but I need to make it because it'll lead me to the next point. You know, one of the reasons this is happening is because the U.S. pulled out its troops, right? As soon as they pulled out the troops, the Taliban moved in, right? So we pulled out the troops, the help. We can't protect them anymore, so the enemy moved in. My point is here that the church has the same role. When the church decides to pull away from reaching the nations and helping the people, we do the same thing that the government's doing, right? We're leaving the people defenseless against the enemy. And we're telling them, you know, fend for yourself. And I'm worried about as a church today. Because this situation will happen here or happen anywhere, politically will happen anywhere. It's been happening in Venezuela for a long time, waiting for help. No, no help has come, you know, to get away the dictatorship we have there. But so this is something that's going to keep going on all over the world. But the church, this is even worse because the church has the same role. And when the church decides that to settle for bronze... Settle for going to church and singing and worshiping and whatever, and they think that's the greatest thing. And we abandon the people that are lost, then we're no better. We're actually worse because the Bible says that we're supposed to be the salt of the earth. We're supposed to be bring healing, right? That's what salt is, preserves you know, from corruption. Uh, we're supposed to be the light of the world, right? We're supposed to shine hope. To people. And when the churches doesn't do their job, then the nations are left on their own. And the enemy moves in. Very dangerous. I got it. I was, I, I saw a, a story on Facebook last night while I was praying. Uh, and uh, somebody posted, somebody here in Cincinnati posted something about Afghanistan. And it broke my heart because it's true, because uh, last night, about 11 o'clock at night, it was going to be, I forget, it was going to be 8.30 in the morning or something like that, and the churches in Afghanistan would be meeting. And the Taliban had already sent messages to the churches saying, we know who you are, we're coming for you. You know, all the Christians, you know, if you meet, we're coming for you. you we're going to stop this. So last night they were saying, hey, about midnight, 11 something, start praying for the Christians there because they're going to become the persecuted. I, I didn't even know this, but recently uh, the church is growing faster in Afghanistan. There's only a, another place that's growing faster. It's Iran. Christians are growing. Uh, people are becoming Christians, these two countries. So there's a lot of new believers in Afghanistan. And today... They faced it. I don't know. I haven't checked my phone. I don't know what's going on. But there's probably going to be some news about shootings of Christians today. And these people are so hungry for God that they will, that they will go to worship even under the biggest threats. Right? And we, we can't just sit around and not do anything. We've got to do something. These people are committed to for their faith, they're willing to give their life. What are you willing to give? And God's not asking much, you know. It's like, what do you have to give? You know, there's there is ways for us to be involved. I love the story of the uh, going back to the Olympics. Uh, I forget the name of this guy, but he's the one that won the gold uh, in the hundred meter uh, race with hurdles, and. Uh, the U.S. guy, uh, Holloway or something like that, was, was the favorite and had actually beat him in the sem semifinals or something like that or in the qualifying. And, but it, it was an upset. He, he beat the American guy and got number one, got the gold medal. And what's so special about this? Well, it turns out that he almost didn't win the medal because that day he took the wrong bus to the stadium to compete. And he ended up going in the wrong direction. Instead of going to the, where the track and field was, he read the wrong sign and ended up going to the opposite side of the city. And by the time he figured out that he was lost, right, he, uh, he's like, well, the only thing I can take, take the bus back to the villa 
and from the villa take the right bus and that I'm not going to make it for the warm ups and the whatever and uh, he was all worried so he asked this young lady for directions first of what he should do and he turns out that this uh, young lady uh, not only told him how to get back but she said you know what uh, I'll pay for a cab so you can actually get there directly and get there on time he didn't have any cash on him you know, they don't usually carry cash so it's like that he didn't have money for a, a taxi so this girl stranger paid for his cab ride he made it on time he won the gold medal and if you look him up on the Instagram it would be easier if I told him your na his name but somebody can look it up but uh, if you look him up I did uh, last night actually it's a really cool video of him explaining all this and he says uh, he's, he's doing a, a, a selfie video and he says I'm on my way back to this was after winning the gold medal I'm on my way back to see that girl that gave me the money for the taxi to thank her because it's, it's only because of her that I could win a gold medal today. So he got on the bus, and he's doing the, the video and stuff. He's on the way back. He runs into the girl. The girl recognizes him, and she didn't know he'd won anything, you know. <laughs> and he's like, I want to I wanna show you something. I want to give you something, you know. And uh, he pulls out his gold medal. He's like, look, I won this thanks to you today because you helped me. She was a good Samaritan, right? And... Uh, he gave her a T-shirt. He gave her his money back from the taxi, too. You know, he can afford it now. He can sell that gold medal. Uh, <laughs> but he, <laughs> it, was, it was cool. I liked it. And the, and the girl was like, well, well uh, I did realize that also that uh, she got an invitation from Jamaica uh, to, tour, the con to to tour Jamaica for free or whatever. So the tourism in Jamaica, the whatever, the president invited her because of her act. And this is, I love this because um, a lot of the work that needs to be done cannot be done unless common people like you and me get involved in, and give, do something. Do a little. Give a little. Go a little out of your way to make sure that people, the lost, get to the right place. Right? It doesn't take much. This girl didn't even know what she was doing. She didn't know that this guy even had a chance to win gold. She's like, this is a loser probably, you know. What a, <laughs> this is a waste of money. But it was a great investment, right, for her and her vacation to Jamaica now. So, uh, and everybody will remember her story. Small thing, small thing that she did. And that can be us. We can do small things, including... Just something as simple as when you give offering to the church, right? When you give your offerings every Sunday. Sometimes you're wondering, like, where's that money going to, you know? Is this going to be spent correctly or not? Or is it just going to be wasted? Is Ben going to buy a steak with that or what? You know? Ben's big enough. You know, he eats a lot of steak. You're wondering that. But let me tell you that, you know, part of your money goes to the mission field and to evangelism and outreaches like people like us in Venezuela. So when you give, and I need, you need to know this, that you're actually helping people win gold medals. You know, you're helping people find, get on that airplane. You're helping people find hope. So don't be like, oh, I have to give this money or this hurts or whatever. Be excited. It's like, yes, this is for, you never know what God's going to do with it. Maybe God's going to multiply it, you know. It's funny because I, I heard that illust an illust uh, pastor give an illustration about that, the 5,000, uh, how Jesus did the miracle. And uh, I always imagined, you know, Jesus was like, okay, everybody close their eyes. I'm going to pray to the Father and when you open their eyes, something's going to happen. So everybody close their eyes. And then kind of, I know that, you know, Peter and some of them are peeking or whatever. And, uh, and God's over there, you know, the image of, you know, he's praying there. And, and uh, you can see Peter peeking there. I knew it. <coughs> and uh, all of a sudden, I count of three, everybody opened their eyes. And there's, you know, food everywhere, like a banquet, you know, like that's how I imagined it. But I, I like the way this preacher told it. He said that. The scripture is not clear, but it says that he told the, the disciples to give food to the people. And the actual miracle happens when, uh, according to him, is when people, they start giving out the food, there was enough food for everybody. 
So apparently they start breaking the pieces of bread that they had, and as they keep breaking it, it never runs out until everybody has enough, and then they still break it. They stop breaking the bread because, you know, they fill up 12 baskets full. I don't know if it happened like that, or I like more the other one, like, psh, you know, that, that one. But if it's the other way, imagine if the disciples said, I'm not going to hand out that. I'm not going to be embarrassed. You know, how small do I have to break this? It'll be like the communion cup things. Those things are like <laughs> put in your mouth and it disappears, right? I don't know how. <laughs> they're probably, but they obeyed. They went out and started handing out the food, you know. And all of a sudden, they're still, they're still left for one more, one more. And that's how it went, right? So what can God do with yours? If you obey him, if you let him use you. No more excuses how young you are, how old you are, how busy you are, you know, or I haven't been called to do this because we have, you know. There's a, I got another image, right? Um, you guys have probably seen this image too. It's an it's a image of Florida building. Remember this, beginning of the summer? Surfside, uh, Miami, uh, collapsing. A hundred, some people were supposed to be missing. Um, I started following that news. I was so desperate. I was like, I just hope they, you know, they start finding, rescuing people from underneath the, all that rubble and all that stuff. And so every day I was checking the news, see who got rescued. And, you know, day one, nobody. Day two, nobody. It's like, wow, how many days can somebody go, with, you know, being trapped down there if they're injured or whatever? Day three, nothing. Finally, at the end of the day, of the week, I think they gave up, right? They hadn't rescued anybody. And, um, and they decided to tear down the rest of the building. And finally, they just got the bodies out, you know, one by one. 98 people, right, uh, died in that, in that event. So I was at my friend's uh, in Indianapolis, Todd Holdsworth. Some of you guys might know, remember him from college. And... Um, we were talking about this story, you know, how sad this was. And, uh, and he said, oh, yeah, did you, did you see the picture? And I was like, yeah, I've seen a lot of pictures. Which one in particular? He's like, look at this one, the picture from above. I was like, yep, yeah, it's not much different from above from below. I mean, what am I looking at? And I didn't get it. And uh, he, said, he said, did you see the name of where this happened? Yeah, Surfside. Does that ring any bell? And I was like, nope. Can you help me? I'm still trying to figure out this puzzle. And he's like, okay, look at that building next door. He's like, that's the building we stayed out five years ago when we went on vacation. And that's the room you stayed on, that balcony that looked over at this building. And that's the pool. I jumped in with my camera, and my camera died. I remember that. So, uh, so yes, I remember the building. And I remember looking out that balcony thinking, it's in the way I can't see the beach. <laughs> and then I was thinking, well, these people live close to the beach. It's nice to live there. You know, they live right in front of the beach. It's really cool. And, uh, and what, something I usually do, I pray for people around me. Like, I, I pray. I was like, Lord, I pray for these people that live around here. You will reach them, touch them. Something I usually do. I never had any idea that those people in front of me this would happen five years later yeah, or something like that. I don't remember the exact date, but I, I didn't know that. And if I did, I'd probably, I'd do something, right? I'd put flyers. I'd think I'd crazy. I'd like, how would you know this? Are you in architecture? Do you, do you know anything? They wouldn't believe me, but I still would try to do something because I know the future, back to the future, whatever. Anyways, probably nobody would believe me, but I still would try. Now, the interesting thing is that with Christianity, we do know the future. We know the buildings are collapsing around us. The world is coming to an end. Jesus is coming back. You know, he's going to save those who put his trust in him. Those who hear the good news. Those that are found. We know that, and we need to make sure people hear about it. We can do something and not wait until it happens. So that's, that, that is a, that's a difference, you know. What are you doing for that? 
It, it can be a small thing. It doesn't have to be much. On my, uh, this week, a friend of mine from Venezuela, uh, he lives in Cincinnati now, uh, uh, was flying in, and um, I went to pick him up at the airport to take him. He lives here now in Cincinnati. And uh, I went to take him to to his house and uh, drop him off. Brett was with me. He's here today. And uh, I actually invited my friend to come to church. Is he here? No? Good. I can tell the story, the story then. <laughs> so our plan, Brett and my friend, my friend's not a Christian, right? So he's been to the church a few times, but... We haven't had the ta- chance to really talk to him about Christ and everything. So our plan was we'd go pick him up at the airport. It's like 40 minutes away. We get to talk to him the whole way back. So we're like praying and getting all ready. Pick him up, put him in the car. And uh, a little, we talked about some other stuff. And okay, now it's time. We change the direction. We start talking about the gospel, you know, about this need for him to come to the Lord. And, uh, and I was worried because I know I need about an hour and the ride's only 40 minutes and I'm barely going to get to the good stuff when I get there before I drop them off. So I was thinking, I need to drive as slow as possible <laughs> on this highway. So I've never driven that slow. I'm usually the one, you know, pushing the speed limit, you know. I was going, why was I going? Brett was like, man, we're going to get pulled over because we're going so slow. You know, so we're preaching. He's like, pray, he's next to me praying. It's all in Spanish, everything. So, um, and we're, we're driving. I'm telling him the gospel. And, and, and I, I keep asking, Brett, how many exits do we have? And he, I keep asking him. He's like, we got three, two exits. And I was like, oh, man, I need to slow down even more. <laughs> I'm not going to make it. So um, a cool thing happened. It started pouring down rain. And I'm talking so hard that I had to slow down even more. You know that thing you can't see anything in front? I was like, thank you, Lord, for this is a good excuse. Got, the kid's going to start wondering, why are you going so slow? You know, <laughs> he was going to start catching on to what was going on here, that we were trying to evangelize him. So God sent this point out right now. I was like putting all the windshield, putting my emergency lights on, going in the right lane really slow as far as we preach the gospel all the way there. And it gave me enough time to go through the whole plan of salvation with him. I'd like to tell you that he accepted Christ. Uh, he didn't, not yet at least, but I needed a few more minutes for that. But <laughs> no, it was, it, but it was awesome because what do you have? Maybe some is just a, a ride home with somebody. I mean, it doesn't take much, but you need to be proactive. You know what, why I did this? Why oh, I felt bad? Because he actually lived in the building across from me in Venezuela. Not even the building across. He lived in the floor above me, in the hallway across. And I had never preached the gospel to him before. And he moved to the United States. I never got a chance. And if something happened to him, right, died COVID or earthquake or something on the airplane, who knows, any disaster, how would I feel knowing that he was my neighbor, he was in front of me, and I never you know, at least gave him the whole plan of salvation. Gave him a chance, a fighting chance. I was hoping he would be here today. He said he was coming, but he didn't make it. So at least you guys got to hear the story. But pray for him. His name's Andres. Uh, and Brett will continue the work, right, Brett? I'm gone. Reminds me of one last story, and we're going to close with this. I know time's up. Um, Back in, like, I think it was Syria, um, about 25 years ago, there was an earthquake like the one in Haiti. 25,000 people died that day. And there was this father. It was in the middle of the day. School was in session. And his father had sent his son to school that day. And, uh, and he ran to school. And when he got to school, he saw the place was flattened. I mean, there's... No, probably no chance of anybody surviving. There wasn't even people looking because all the rescues are scrambling out to all the different buildings in the city. And uh, so he desperately he started moving rocks the little bit he could. And he, he started going out for hours and hours. And the other parents were crying for their kids. And he finally, parents are like, What's, can you stop it? You're just making us... 
You're giving us false hope. Stop doing that. You know, it's, there's nothing to do. You need to mourn. And the parent said that he wasn't going to do that because he had promised his son time after time that any time his son needed him, he would be there for him. And this time, is if, if he ever needed him, it was this time. So he kept digging and throwing rocks this way and that way. He was 10 hours digging. 12 hours, 24 hours digging, no hope. 30 hours digging, 32, 34, 36 hours, 38 hours. When he's about to give up, he moves a big stone. And underneath that stone, he sees there's like a little hole. Uh, and he screams down that hole. He's like, Osman, Osman, can you hear me? That's the name of his son. And a voice comes back saying, yes, dad, I hear you. I told my friends that you would come for me because you said you'd always be here for me, that you would come and rescue us. And they were able to rescue 13 students from that pocket that got, they got saved miraculously in there because this dad did not give up on his promise to do everything to search and rescue his son that was lost. And Jesus has the same passion. He came down to earth to rescue the lost. Do you have the same passion that you're going to keep going at it as long as it takes to help people find their way back to Jesus? Anyway, with any gift that God gives you. And not, not settle for bronze, not settle for silver, settle for gold only you know how this verse starts it says I read it you probably didn't catch it verse 31 it says Jesus told him come away by yourself to a lonely place and rest a while for there were many people coming and going they did not even have time to eat the disciples had been preaching and they forgot they had to eat. They weren't even hungry because they were doing God's will. And when you're doing God's will, when you're going for gold, you are satisfied. So what makes you hungry? What satisfies you today? I invite you to try doing this. Try giving anything you can to uh, reaching the lost, whether it's locally, far away. I mean, there is no limit with what God can use. As we pray, as we stand, the, the worship team is going to come forward. And if you haven't made, given your life to the Lord, I mean, this is a good day to do it and say, man, Jesus came and rescued me. Like that father did not give up, you know. He didn't leave any stone unturned until he found me. And we should have that same passion. If you want to accept Christ today, we invite you to do so as we sing and pray today. God, we thank you for, for being our shepherd, Lord, for being that good shepherd that keeps working, that never gives up on us, Lord. And I pray that we will never give up on our friends and our friends and our family and that you will never, that we will never give up, Lord, of taking the good news, uh, not believe the lies of what little we have, but thank you. Think about what we do have, Lord. Help us be a church that's just committed to seeing the lost rescued. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.